Chapter 37 Copper from Water, Opal from the Sea We headed back north over forest country, my mate immediately reverting to his quiet moods, seldom speaking either by day or night unless spoken to, trudging mile after mile behind him in boyish impatience, I thought, he should never leave the jungles, the only place where he's human, but then I'd think it over in growing surprise the many things he had taught me, some of which I only began to realize as the hours trudged by of strange facts of scrub and forest and water-torn gorge, of animal and plant, bird, reptile, and insect, my thoughts would then drift on to amazing information on the properties of metals I'd never heard of, not even in mining camps, not even in the Silver City, now so far away. Little thoughts of resentment at his moody ways would be quite lost as I pondered over those strange things about humans, us, and primitive men he'd half told, half hinted at, and I'd wonder and wonder how much more he knew until with a shiver I'd suddenly remember his thought reading and say something abruptly, say anything just to try to start a conversation. In the hills near the head of the Walsh River, we struck the coach road to Herberton, and eventually at Watsonville, a lively mining camp. I rebelled, eager to greet my fellow men again. Besides, I'd heard many stories, past and present, of the glories of Watsonville, the fortunes won from its rich tin loads and rich copper. Very well, he shrugged. I'll camp down by the creek, so please yourself. I'll give you until midday tomorrow. Then I'm moving off. I'm going to be in Herberton by mid-afternoon. As he strode away, I felt a bit sorry. I had half expected him to move on without me. I walked on into the dusty little township. Men burnt brown as the hills were knocking off work. and strolling to camp, or to one of the tiny pubs, to wash the dust and copper fumes from their throats. I was eager to spy out Gibbs Hotel, for he was the prospector who had found Irvine Bank, and a prospector who had found a rich mineral field was a hero. I would only be able to gaze from afar, not being able to afford more than two beers at the most. Difficult indeed to realize today the value of a shilling those days to those who did not have it. However, the hail fellow well met of the mining camps was wonderful, and I spent an entrancing evening so far, far as shyness would permit the little notebooks being long since filled up. There was no drudgery here, interesting facts and yarns being committed to the light-hearted mercies of a happy-go-lucky memory, much too happy-go-lucky, and I was to realize with re regret in coming years. Watsonville was named after Bob Watson, who, with Connolly and Daughtry, pushed out from Herberton in the early years and found these hills rich in minerals. In the rush that followed, a few men were killed by the blacks, but rich claims were quickly found. The Great Western was still going strong. The King of the Ranges, the fabulously rich North Australian, the boys that evening reeled off the names of a score of shows, 
the returns from which fairly made my mouth water. I used to wonder when the wretched wars came at the fabulous fortunes, the hard toiling men who found those little mines would have made had they found them during the war years and after. At this time a rich new show, the plum had been found and was destined to produce some wonderful returns. The first battery was built by an ingenious Tasmanian name, named Dempster and was powered by the waters of the Walsh River by a Pelton wheel. It had crushed thousands of tons of stone for the early mines. I wished the jungle man had been there to hear that, but then remembered he must know all about it. By now I would have been surprised to hear of anything that was strange to him. It did not surprise me, though, to hear John Moffat constantly mentioned, now working the North Australian on a big scale. Here again were many tales of luck and fortune, of dogged perseverance and heartbreak that are the very life of every mining field. How I longed to try my luck for a few months. At least among these hills came the sudden realization that just a few short trips with the jungle man had taught me how impossible was this constant longing. A man would have to possess as many lives as a cat, I thought despondently. Even Methuselah would grow old trying to prospect all this district. And the same old problem was here, too. It was only the very lucky ones who found the rich shows. The big majority were barely scratching out a living. Many were working outright for wages. To go farther afield meant transport, pack horses, saddlery, tools, tucker, money. With my head full of local mining yarns, I found my mate's lonely camp at midnight, agreeably surprised to find he had a billy of tea on the simmer, a hunched-up shadow wrapped in his blanket on the creek sand. He was sound asleep, or was he? But that tea went down well. Breakfast was scanty. We could not whip out the rifle here and bring down game as we walked along. This was civilization, feeling a bit peckish and guilty too, at almost forcing him to camp the night. I was ready to move off with him, but he nodded back towards the township. Better make the most of your time, he said quietly. Have a look around the North Australian. Get them to show you how they extract pure copper from water. From water, I said blankly. Yes, water, you don't believe me, but they'll prove it. I'll meet you outside the pub at midday. I've got enough to shout us both a feed before we move off and pulling out his pipe he half turned to gaze across at the hills. Eagerly I started walking towards the poppet heads high above the big dumps, and they did show me how to extract pure copper from water. Not only that, but they showed me shovels and picks and spiders of copper, handsome they were, showed me horseshoes and old billy cans and tins and all matter of things, once old iron. Now transformed into bright copper, like most other things, simple of course, when you know how. This mine was very rich in copper, the water which seeped from it and which had collected in disused shafts 
was highly impregnated with copper in solution. Throw iron into the water and in the course of time the iron was eaten away and copper was precipitated upon it in its place. As to the shovels, they had been left by oversight for some time in a drive the drip of copper impregnated water upon them and upon two picks and iron spiders had eaten away a film of the iron and precipitated copper in its stead. It is a purely chemical action. Where mine water is so rich in copper as this, the copper can, with time, be simply recovered by running the water into boxes packed with any old scraps of iron. The iron is eaten away, and in its place is practically pure copper, live and learn. Suddenly I remembered the far away opal fields, and something even more startling. There, deep under solid rock, we quite often dug out shells that once, how many millions of years ago, had been live shellfish. Opal had taken the place of the shell, in some instances forming a perfectly opalized shell. In rarer instances, we found fish deposits of opal on the bones had formed opalized fish. Yes, live and learn, but as the jungle man would say, you must memorize to learn. Otherwise, you could grow old as Methuselah and merely be a living fossil. Walking back along the dusty road to Herberton, beside my quiet mate, I was thinking on how much I'd learnt during the short time I'd known him. Amazing, and I knew that I didn't even know him. Pleasant indeed to sight the seven hills of Herberton, Again, the little town gleaming under the sunlight that showers down through the exhilarating air far over that top of the world. Little wonder the citizens justly claim the old-timers refuse to die until their whiskers sprout into feathers. Lightly dismounting, several horsemen were tethering their horses outside Jack and Newell's store as my mate half turned towards me and drawled, Well, I suppose you'll be making back to your camp now. Regards to old Mick and your friends. I hope you enjoyed your walkabout. We'll be seeing you so long. And with a nod, he turned and was strolling along the road in the direction of the dry river. I stared after him a bit disappointedly then turned and stepped out along the road by the wild river. With a cheery greeting from some passerby, I'd come to know each step taking me more eagerly towards Nigger Creek, how different this freedom of road and open country and sky and sunlight, quiet bustle and cheery talk of friendly people, to the gloomy depths, the breathless silence, the overpowering hostility of vegetable life of the big scrub. I could hardly get to Nigger Creek quick enough to be greeted by the chuckling grin of Old Mick, the staturin welcome of Jim Bell, the lumbering friendliness of Big Old Brooks, the excited boyish welcome of Garnet Atchison, the chirpy welcome of little Tommy Turley, the slow smile of Long Stewart, the cheery welcome of Miss Reynolds, and the girls and Grig, the storekeeper, and the whole tiny camp. There'd be a smile, too, from the nice girl in the creeper-clad cottage who had patted the fat duck. The wild river was singing beside me again. I caught first glimpse of the little cottages, clinging around Wandekla, the meeting of the waters right there at Nigger Creek. At my tiny camp, all alone, on the ridge, the tent was a bit windblown. A whopping big goanna 
scuttled out and hissed violently as I opened my own tent door, and it was obvious that the possums had been holding nightly parties there. But old Mick had seen to it that everything was all right. At old Mick's campfire, all were in great form. Mick and Jim had struck a patch that looked like developing into good dirt, and were toiling like galley slaves to prove it one way or the other. Even old Mick was talking learnedly of so many pounds to the yard, and all hands were anxious that these promising prospects would make and yield the two hard-bitten mates a hundred pounds or two or more in a short time. In all the mining fields, this enthusiasm for other people's luck was a help to everyone. The boys were curious to hear of my little adventures, of course, especially Garnet. I said little of the jungle man. Having fully realized by now, like me, they simply did not understand him. Because of some undefined feeling, I felt anxious to protect him how he would have grinned had he known. He was a man who would never be popular. He would always be a lonely man. I felt relieved when they asked only a very few questions about him. Well now, I said brightly, there's tons and tons of fortunes. Way back in them thar hills, though we didn't find any. They're lying there only awaiting you experienced mineral chasers. And now, Mick, have you written any new poems since I've been away? Or a love letter, or maybe two? Don't tell me your pen has gone rusty just because you found a whopping big tin mine. At the grins on all their firelit faces, Jim Bell frowned. For once in his life, he's been using the pick instead of the pen. First time he's been of use since I've known him. You don't make allowance for Mick's romantic nature, said Garnet. After all, Jim, life is not all pick and shovel. No, and it's not all soft soap and poetry either, answered Jim. And there's such a thing as a pub handy and an empty pocket when a man is perishing of thirst and an empty belly when he can't pay the storekeeper's bill. That's only because you're not one of the early settlers, said Mick mildly. What the hell have the early settlers got to do with it? snapped Jim. What do you mean by an early settler? An early settler pays his bill on the first of every month, said Mick. Jim's long mustache fairly twitched, but before he could think up a reply, Garnet said laughing, I believe you have written something. Mick, I can see it in that grizzled old face of yours, like the cat that swallowed the canary, like a gorilla that swallowed a hot boiled egg, growled Jim. I have found time for a little composition, old Mick murmured angelically. I thought so, cried Garnet triumphantly. I saw it in that battered countenance of yours. Out with it, is it a poem? No, answered Mick modestly, merely an epistle. Who to? Miss, in the momentary silence, Garnet gasped. Oh, heavens, no Mick. But Mick just grinned at the fire. Tell me, I asked eagerly, who is the lady? She was member of a more or less official party from Cairns in connection with the opening of a little school for the Tumalin settlers' children, explained the troubled Garnet. All bigwigs, she is the young wife of one of them. They've only been married a couple of years. She is a most charming person. They did me the courtesy of paying me a visit on their way to the Tumalin. This prize idiot happened to stroll along, and I was fool enough to introduce him as a local curiosity, and Garnet glared at the complacent Mick. A world curiosity, declared Jim Bell, as he grinned from ear to ear, 
And did you hear what the schoolmaster just called you? Chapter 38 Jim Bell Laughs Loudest Garnet was ever a flatterer, replied the cunning Mick. If I said what I really mean, threatened Garnet, look here, you grinning old heathen. You have not really posted that lady one of those asinine letters of yours, surely. No, Mick smirked. Ah, breathed Garnet relievedly. I've been waiting for Jack to return before I posted it, grinned Mick. You wretched old fox, declared Garnet. I shall certainly censor that poisonous epistle of yours. Good boy, Mick, I laughed. Have you got it there? Read it out. Which was echoed by all hands, except the schoolmaster. As Mick retired to some secret hideout within the camp, Jim grinned at Garnet. Well, there now, you and Jack have been encouraging this prize goat for quite a time past, and just what do you think of him horning in now? There's no telling what repercussions one of those awful letters of Mick's might start in this case, replied Garnet uneasily. Remember, these are very nice people. They're all nice to Mick, replied Jim, in a satisfied sort of way. Anyway, serves you jolly well right for encouraging him. I only wish he'd drop a line to Jack's lady friend. She'd think I'd gone nuts in May, I grinned. Anyway, mine is one of those hopeless sorts of love. She won't have me. Who would, laughed Garnet as Mick reappeared, tenderly nursing his precious scribbling pad. The grizzled old ganger was obviously well pleased with himself. Taking his time, he made himself quite comfortable. Then, with sundry sighs and awes, slowly began to drone out his epistle. One decla via Herberton, full moon. He paused for us to admire this touch. Dearest, he went on, in hopeless longing, I can but pen my deepest thoughts to you as a star seen from afar. You can but ever appear as a beautiful vision to me, and thus I have gazed upon you, my heart breaking that you did not could never know. Alas, could I but wield the magic wand with the perfection of poor goldsmith to convey to you my poor heart's yearnings. For, forced by the irony of cruel fate, to live among rough, uncouth men as I am. Ya, yeah, grunted Jim Bell with startling loudness, and that from a buck navvy, a ganger too, a nigger driver. For heaven's sake, let the ass finish, implored Garnet. Let's get this over. But the others of us were imp impishly amused. I was delighted the more I sympathized with Garnet. Old Mick smoothed his wrinkled brow, sniffed a time or two, drew a deep contemplative breath, then started again. For living among rough, uncouth men, as I am, I fly to secret thoughts of you to fill the heart with ambrosial sweetness. Alas, that I must ever awake to the loud laugh, the vacant mind, the coarseness around me. Well, I'll go hopping to hell, declared Jim Bell. Old Brooks laughed like a rumbling old bull. Little Tommy Turley chuckled like a chattering possum. I laughed heartily at the anguished expression on the young schoolmaster's face.
With an uplifted, aggravating composure, Old Mick finally consented to carry on again. Dearest, please write me but one little line, that the sweetness of your thoughts cause my soul to soar, unstained to the heights of heavenly delight. Yours is longing, Harold Hawthorne. Garnet joined in the laughter eventually, but most definitely not in the congratulations. You all know where you stand now with your precious poet, declared Jem Bell with keen satisfaction. Your most valued lady friend is not safe with him, from the old baboon's silly pen. I mean, and you sir and serve you all damn well right, and you just know. Where you all stand too, rough, uncouth men, the loud laugh, our vacant minds, our coarseness, bogging down this honey-heartened poet while he scribbles his sweet nothings to his lady fair, while his coarse mate is swinging the pick and shovel down in the creek to his bowyangs in muck and slush. But Jim's criticism made it seem all the funnier, while old Mick smirked there with his irresistible old grin. Of course, you are not going to post that letter, Garnet smiled ingratiatingly. Sure, replied Mick, but not in little old nigger creek. He smirked meaningly at Garnet. I'm going into Herberton tomorrow. Like hell you are, declared Jim. It's a solid day on the windlass for you tomorrow, my horny-handed poet. But Mick protested Garnet earnestly. Just look what trouble a letter like that would cause. Two people, important people too, only recently married, deeply in love with one another, and that bombshell drops into the happy home. It will make it all the happier, replied Mick virtuously. This epistle from some longing unknown hand will surprise her, take her breath away, then fill her with a delightful curiosity. At last, after changing her mind a dozen times, she'll show it to him. After wanting to pull the place to pieces, he'll grow convinced she knows nothing whatever about the unknown lover, and they'll lose one another better than ever, each secretly interested, too, in knowing there is some unknown rival pinning to come between them from afar. It will bind them all the tighter together, I assure you. <clears throat> He'll hurry home all the earlier. She'll wait all the more eagerly to hear his footsteps coming up the garden path. I'd like to twist your wretched old neck. There's no telling what any woman would do, broken garnet. You should be growing a forked tail and hoofs and horns, you old devil. I've told you so all along, declared Jim Bell in a satisfied voice. Just because from afar my pen has tried to bring a little more happiness into the lives of two nice people, said Mick in injured tones. Look here, Mick, declared Garnet energetically. You'd better burn that precious letter. That gentleman is no fool, and he could be a pretty tough customer. You can measure up men. You've seen him. You know enough about men to realize that much anyway. If he comes raging up here to get his hands on the man who wrote that letter, then it will be my great pleasure to lead him straight to you and I'll clap hands heartily when he wrings you out like a dish cloth and hurls your remains into the wild river. A widening grin spread over old Mick's face from ear to ear. Oh boy, he said mildly, you delight me to think that a humble epistle from my pen could produce such a flurry amidst the intelligent circles. 
at last I have not written in vain, at which Garnet, with a final scorching reprimand, joined in the laughter. You just can't do anything with him, said Long Stuart. He'll post that letter in Herberton for sure. The lady will probably burn it and say nothing about it. If not, well, then well promise Mick a Christian burial. Unless he starts out for the hills first, laughed Tommy Turley. He'd better get a flying start, said Garnet grimly, if I know anything about the gentleman concerned. Again, how different all this was to the big scrubs. These light-hearted evenings under the Milky Way, to the uneasy loneliness, the inky blackness. No such things as laughter in the night there. So it was toil again by day, Mick and Jim stepping out lively to work, now that they were on good dirt, floating across the road from the tiny school, a chorus of child, childish voices as schoolmaster Atchison conducted a singing lesson, old Brooks up on the dump at his windlass, Tommy Turley hauling Mullock too, muffled thunder rolling over the hills. They were shooting again at the Great Northern, maybe the rainbow, Sounds like the Brad Bradliff now, wondering whether the shots would bring down rich stone or only worthless mullock. I climb down the shaft again, light the candle, crawl into the drive, pick up the pick, and delve into the old river bed, with little hope indeed that I might strike a patch here, but a man must knock out Tucker money somehow, as to where a man was to get the money to buy those horses, and twelve months Tucker, before he could ride away to seek a new field. Times were when I longed to be able to travel, and live in scrub or forest as the jungle man could, and where was he now? Life did seem hard at times in the, those wonderful days. I'd hoped that Garnet would not be studying tonight or putting young Galagoli through his paces, that he'd be able to stroll across for a laugh at old Mick's campfire. Pick, pick, thud, thud. I'd wonder what the jungle man was doing and think how independent he was. What a strange life he led, almost frighteningly interesting. He was not a bad sort of a bloke, when you came to understand him, if only you ever could understand him. Queer chap, moody, queer ideas, can smell snakes and things and hear the trees talk. Pick, pick, thud, thud, can read men's thoughts. Pick, pick, thud. Chapter 39 Distant Hills the time came when I made a break. Such a time comes to most of us, fairly often to some. Farther north kept beckoning irresistibly. I had just a few pounds necessary to pay the boat fare north to Cooktown and a month's tucker money over. I'd carry the swag out to gold or tin fields that I was assured somewhat vaguely were out back of Cooktown and Chancet. To stay here meant that I would turn the windlass handle forever and ever, like little Tommy Turley, or so it seemed to, dis to despondent me. Somewhere in that great peninsula, farther north, there surely was country that had never been gone over. Surely some areas, at least, that had not yet known the prospector's pick. That parts of it were still wild, was well enough known for occasionally four or five lines in some newspaper or other told how some wanderer had been speared by the blacks in, su in country such as that there could well be another palmer. I would chance it anyway, and thought of the jungle man, 
would he would he come to be drawn uh, as by a magnet to new country as had Christy Palmerston to the Cairns hinterland then the jungles of Malaya if only the jungle man would come there would not be the loneliness of going alone down below in that deathly quietness in the old river bed in the lonely tent at night after the council fire the more i thought of it the more it seemed he might come i wished i'd guardedly mentioned the idea before we had made quite a number of short trips by now we could put up with each other's company fairly well anyway Ah, uh, if he did agree, he would certainly bring his horses ever so much better. Only the very best of bushmen could find their way over land to Cooktown. So I had been told, well, the jungle man was all that. I was quite certain he only had two horses, but he could find gold. We should very soon have the needed team. One evening, saying nothing to anybody, I walked into Herberton, and next morning at dawn was walking out towards the dry river. His camp was gone, no litter even, let alone rubbish anywhere, just the bare ground where the tent had stood. I inquired of men working a claim farther up river, but they knew nothing. He was here today, gone tomorrow without a word to a soul had left no message woefully dis disappointed i trudged back to herberton surprised at realizing how keenly i had wished he would come neither at jack and newell's nor at the post office had he left a message simply squared up his accounts and gone had not even mentioned that he was leaving the dry river I worked a week longer at Nigger Creek, hoping for a message, but the jungle man had vanished. It came hard indeed to say goodbye to good friends, to old Mick and Jim Bell, old Brooks and little Tommy Turley, and Long Stewart and other friends I'd made, and to Garnet Atchison. How strange is life! We little knew that within a few years Garnet and I were, were to meet again under the shadow of the Turkish guns before Beersheba.